And joining us now on the line from Minneapolis, Minnesota, where he's been covering the Republican National Convention for the Globe and Mail, there's columnist John Ibbotson. How are you tonight, John? Good, Stephen. How are you? A-OK. -okay. How are you after Sarah Palin's speech last night? Did you like it? It was the kind of speech that the Republican National Convention really needed to hear. Uh, it energized the crowd tremendously. I think it's also the kind of speech that the Republican conservative base uh, was looking for in terms of economics, in terms of aggressiveness in attacking the Democrats and Barack Obama. Um, so she made it through the first night, and that was a big first night, um, and kudos to her. There is a long road ahead, eight weeks of it, including a debate with the Democratic Vice President Joe Biden. And uh, how she performs over those eight weeks is still an open question. This is uh, someone who was not very long ago a small town mayor and who's now in the biggest political stage on the planet. So it's going to be fun to watch. Apparently 37 million people, which is just one million fewer than Barack Obama, watched that speech last night. And in case any of our viewers were not among that 37 million, I'm going to play a little snippet right now. Michael, if you would, roll tape. This world of threats and dangers it's not just a community, and it doesn't just need an organizer. And though both Senator Obama and Senator Biden have been going on lately about how they're always, quote, fighting for you, let us face the matter squarely. There is only one man in this election who has ever really fought for you. And that, of course, she believes is John McCain. The speech was filled with a lot of sarcastic references to her opposing ticket. Both she, Mike Huckabee, Rudy Giuliani, Mitt Romney, they all got out there with their guns ablazing at Barack Obama. You think that was the right strategy? It's the right strategy if you want to play by Carl Wolf's playbook. And I think that's, in fact, uh, what we're seeing now. Um, it was not that long ago that these two candidates promised a very civil campaign, a courteous campaign, a debate on the issues. But ever since Steve Schmidt, who is a sort of protege of Karl Rove, took over the McCain campaign, uh, it's been getting, been getting more negative, more aggressive. And I think what we saw in the convention uh, last night was a full declaration of war. This is going to be a values-based election campaign, not an issues-based one. And as you well know, values-based campaigns are the nastiest of all. So we're back to the culture wars in the United States then, is that it? I'm afraid we are. I think uh, in I mean, that incredibly aggressive speech by Rudy Giuliani last night, and in the pretty aggressive uh, attacks uh, of, of Governor Palin herself, uh, we witnessed um, what's going to be the uh, sort of the down and dirty side of the, uh, of, of the Republican campaign. And I have no doubt that if it starts to have an effect in the polls, and it usually does, uh, the Democrats will respond in kind. Now, because you're a columnist and not just a reporter, you're allowed to have an opinion about this, so I'm going to ask it. With the benefit now of a week's worth of hindsight and all of the reportage about, you know, her private life, her family life, her, uh, some of the controversial decisions she's taken as governor, how does the pick of Sarah Palin a week later suit you? It was a risky pick from the beginning. Um, and a week later, she's still alive. The media was going to go crazy as soon as they uh, heard about this pick because they knew nothing about her, that she was a blank slate. And they were going to go full bore trying to find out stuff about her. And stuff rushed out. By the way, some of it wrong, some of it inaccurate, and, and some of it perhaps overblown. Uh, but everything that anybody got their hands on, they rushed into printer on the air or more likely onto the blogosphere. And it did lead to a feeding frenzy that by Tuesday was getting out of hand. Um, I think the media have started to dial it down a bit, as the Republicans begged them to do. Her own performance, I think, um, has, a, has assuaged the fears, at least, of those inside the McCain camp and, and again, of the, of the Republican base. Um, so she's still standing. Is she an asset for the campaign? I, I don't think we could possibly say that yet. Uh, and whether she turns out to be an asset or a liability is something we're only going to find out after she's done two or three press conferences with the media, after she's had that debate, and after we sh we've seen how she's performed. Because it is the job of the vice president, in some ways, to be the attack dog for the presidential candidate, to say the things that the presidential candidate uh, really shouldn't be seen saying. Joe Biden is very good, as they say, at sort of eviscerating you while he's smiling. Um, and we're going to see whether this uh, self-described hockey mom from a small town in Alaska uh, has got what it takes uh, to, to you know, pull off that kind of attack, especially since it seems that those attacks are going to be pretty, pretty severe. Hmm. John, one of the reasons we wanted you on the program tonight was that you've had the, uh, you know, there are not very many people on this continent who've covered Ottawa, covered Queen's Park, 
covered Washington, D.C. You've seen politics from a, a bunch of different capital cities. Given your knowledge of Canadian politics and now what you're picking up being down in the States, could a Sarah Palin phenomenon, if you will, take place in Canada? No. Um, nor could a Barack Obama phenomenon. And that's uh, the sad truth of it. I've often described Barack Obama as the multicultural Canadian prime minister that Canada never had. But it would be very hard for Barack Obama uh, to become the leader of one of the major political parties. Because I went into this campaign uh, quite skeptical, uh, skeptical about the American primary system. Um, why, how these little states with their rural populations exercise this enormous power. Uh, but I become quite a convert because I think this election in particular shows that you can have the Democratic Party machine behind you, as Hillary Clinton did. Um, but that doesn't mean you're going to win over the voters of Iowa and New Hampshire. I was in a little village called Amana in, in Iowa just before the election. Maybe 200 people in that village. Every presidential candidate from both parties had visited that village. And you know, they, they all did the same thing. They sat there and they took questions until people had run out of questions to ask. And if you want to become leader of the free world, you have to do that. It's like a jury that the Americans pick at the beginning to vet candidates. And it allows candidates to come from outside to come from outside the party establishment um, and impress those voters and then, the, then impress the larger voters, number of voters in, in the ensuing primaries. And it's how John McCain could be, you know, completely routed in the summer, retreat to New Hampshire, and then come back and take the, the, uh, the nomination. It's how Barack Obama could be, come from being a little-known senator to being the Democratic uh, presidential nominee. And the sad truth is that in Canada, we have a much more closed, elitist political system. If you want to get on in one of the major political parties, then you have to run for a uh, nomination, say, uh, in, in a riding, work your way up, uh, earn the, uh, the approval of the leader of the party, earn the approval of the, of the party bosses. If you're going to run for the leadership, then you have to appeal to that much, much smaller base of voters, those who are active card-carrying liberals and who Democrats are conservatives. And it means that the, the vetting process in, in our system makes it much harder for sort of outri outriders, as it were, to, to come in and capture it. We saw uh, Michael Ignatieff try and fail, for example. Um, and I think, in a way, it, it demonstrates that the American system, for all our sort of smug Canadian assumptions that, it's, that only big money and big interests can, uh, can run the pl American political system, in fact, it proves that our system is, much, is more closed than theirs. There is actually more open uh, and offers more opportunity for candidates to come in and just make the pitch on their own directly to the electorate. Yeah, in fact, our campaigns are, what, 30-some-odd days, and theirs are two years long. It really is a grind down there. You've been vetted by the time you win down there, haven't you? If you, uh, Alan Greenspan uh, said that anybody who uh, wants, applies for the job of president of the United States should be disqualified merely by the act of applying, because <laughs> it's such an incredibly hard job. Right. Uh, it takes two years of your life um, and your family's life, and, you know, relentless media scrutiny of everything that you've ever done in your past. But Americans demand it. Uh, we didn't have election fatigue in, in this campaign. Um, voters were very anxious to see who the candidates were in both parties and um, were happy to have at least one full year of active campaigning in, in the primaries and in the general election. Hmm. Uh, John, again, the Canadian and American comparison. Do our politicians reach for different triggers, if you like, uh, be they values, issues, hot buttons, whatever, versus the ones that American politicians reach for? Well, there is a, a difference there too, yes. Um, and this is a values-based vote down here, and the values are uh, mu very much based on, uh, well, for one thing, on religion, which, you know, as you know, just never is, enters into it. Each candidate has to demonstrate to the voters that he is a good Christian, and that's all there is to it. Um, and you, you, I always found myself a bit uncomfortable sitting, listening to Hillary. I remember one of the debates where Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama talked about the nature of faith and how it had sustained them through the trials of the past. The question would never even have been asked of, of a Canadian politician. Um, there's also, of course, just a much more intense patriotism down here. Um, love of country, are you truly an American, and what does it mean to be an American, is an election campaign issue. It's a, it's a vital election campaign issue in this campaign because John McCain and the Republicans are suggesting subtly, perhaps, that Barack Obama isn't really as an American as, uh, as they think an American ought to be. And, of course, Barack Obama is violently complaining that uh, he is every bit as patriotic as, as anybody else. Again, you wouldn't have that debate in Canada. So, I mean, those are, are two areas um, where the, the American 
cam campaigns focus on that Canadian campaigns would, uh, would, would never go near. And then finally, and perhaps most important, uh, we are a more consensual country. Uh, I often joked when I was in Canada that if you actually looked at the platforms of the Conservatives and the Liberals, they were raging over the most minute thing. Should we have a national daycare plan that's paid for through direct subsidies to, or subsidies to, to daycares or sh daycare agencies, or should they go directly to, to, to the taxpayers? But no one was debating whether we needed a national daycare program. Down here, you fight over really big things, in or out of the war in Iraq. Um, you know, deregulation or, or regulation. Should we actually expand health care to cover the 47 million uh, Americans who don't have it? And, and then how should we do that? Should, what do we do about the 12 illegal uh, million illegal immigrants inside the country? These are big, substantive issues, and both parties are diametrically opposed on a number of them. In our last minute here, John, I want to ask you a, um, a difficult question to sum up in a minute, but let's give it a shot. What is the, now that you've had a chance to cover this campaign for as long as you have, what's the one unusual or distinctive thing you have learned about Americans that you didn't know before? You're not going to like the answer. Uh, when I was coming up to the first anniversary of this beat, I tried to come up with some sort of maxim that I could uh, offer myself when debating in myself about, about issues. And the only thing I could come up with was this, and it sounds ridiculous, that no matter what you say about the United States, the opposite is equally true. It is a <laughs> land of massive contradictions. Yeah. Um, the Northeast is so different from the Southwest. Uh, the African-American and Latino and white communities operate in some ways in their own, uh, own respective ghettos. Um, it is a land of amazing culture and some of, uh, some of the best culture on the planet Earth, and it's a land of horrible culture. It's a la land of universities where you can pay $10 and get a PhD, and it's the land of Harvard. It, much more than Canada, which is, as I say, a, a nation that tries to you know, veer towards the steady middle. This <laughs> is a land that embraces extremes and feeds on that, those, on those extremes. The dynamism of American society, which in the end is its most compelling and attractive quality, is fed by its own internal contradictions because Americans actually embrace those contradictions and, and define themselves within the embrace of those contradictions. Mm -hmm. John, as always, it's so good of you to join us tonight. We'll let you go and watch John McCain's speech now. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure, Stephen.